Good evening, everyone. Um, we are really excited to have all of you joining this evening or afternoon, depending on which time zone you are joining us from. Um, for those who I haven't had the opportunity to meet at one of our in-person events or during your time at Georgia Tech, my name is Jen Whitlow, and I'm our Director of Computing Enrollment and Alumni Engagement here in the College of Computing. And I have the pleasure of moderating tonight's chat. Um, and of course, the person you all came to actually hear uh, that's joining us tonight is Dean Charles Isbell, who is the John P. Imlay Jr. Chair and Dean of the College of Computing, and also a GT Computing alumnus. So we are excited to do these types of events because it's a chance for us to meet with our fellow Georgia Tech Computing alum, uh, but also we wish, and Charles will probably talk about this a little bit, but we wish we could be doing these in person, um, but I guess this is the next best thing. So please feel free to use the Q&A function on the right-hand side as we go along um, if you have questions. And there's also the chat if you would like to chat with each other. Um, but if you do have a question for Charles, use that Q&A function. It's just a little bit easier for us to find all of those um, so that they don't get too lost or buried in that chat. So Charles? Um, I would like to turn it over to you. So welcome everybody and say a few words. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Um, I, I appreciate it and I appreciate all of you uh, coming and joining us uh, today for this. Uh, we'd like to do a lot of these sorts of things in the future. Very sad that we're not able to see you in person, um, but hopefully we will get to um, a place where we're able to do that uh, relatively soon. Um, the, as Jen says, the goal here is mainly for you to be able to ask any questions you want to ask. Uh, Jen has a couple of questions for me, I understand, up front, uh, based on uh, things she's been talking to you about. And so we're going to let her start with those questions. And you add some questions, and we'll do that. And we'll try to we'll try to let you out in about an hour or so. Um, but the goal is to answer as many of your questions as we can and to talk to you about all the cool things that are going on in the college and all the big things that are that are coming down the pike. So, again, thank you very much for joining us here today, and I hope we have a good chance to have a good virtual conversation. Wonderful. So, as we all know, 2020 has been quite the year. Um, many unprecedented changes and, and challenges have arisen, um, and we'll get to those in just a moment, but I figured we should start the evening off with something positive. Um, and so, Charles, can you talk a little bit about some of the successes that we as a college have seen over the last six to seven months since we did our last in-person alumni event? So it's only been six, so it's been six months since we last did something like this, and uh, it might as well have been six years. Uh, the, the number of things that have happened, not just in the world with the pandemic and all the kind of implications for what Georgia Tech's been doing since the end of the spring through the summer and now into the fall, um, those are amazing and large things, but also a bunch of new things have happened uh, with the college. And I, and I just take a moment to share a couple of them with you. Um, the first, I want to tell you something that I always seem to open these kind of conversations with, which is just how much we have grown. So we are large. And we are not just a little bit large, we are a lot large. If this were a year ago, I would be telling you that for the first time in Georgia Tech's entire history, so we're talking about since the Civil War, the largest number of majors to graduate in a given semester, much less a given year, was not mechanical engineering, but it was computer science. That was the first ever, 100 plus years of, of Georgia Tech's existence. We've been the largest major for two or three years now, and we continue to do that. Even as we have seen universities uh, across the country have lower enrollments, uh, Georgia Tech was somewhat worried about this ourselves, particularly at the undergraduate level. Um, the College of Computing and the majors in the College of Computing have grown dramatically. Um, we are now at about 3,300 majors. Um, if we were talking last year, I would tell you that we were somewhere around 2,800 majors. Um, if I were going back to 2015, I would tell you that we were under 2,000 majors. So we have grown by about 60% in the last five years uh, at the undergraduate level. But that's not even beginning to be the story. If you look at our total overall enrollment, we passed a couple of amazing milestones this semester. Georgia Tech is breaking 40,000 students. 
uh, the College of Computing's OMS program, which was at zero six years ago, um, is breaking uh, just about 11,000 students uh, this semester, depending on how you, you count enrollments with, with all of the OMSs. And the total number of students in the College of Computing is officially 15,245. That's a lot of students. And to give you some sense of scale of just how much 15,245 students is, five years ago, 2015, um, we were 5,750. So we've gone from 5,750 to 15,250. And that doesn't even give us credit for all of the students we, we actually have uh, at the graduate level. 15,000 is a big number, 16,000 is a big number. But compare us to the rest of the Institute. That number represents about 39%, 38, 39% of the entire population of Georgia Tech. By contrast, the College of Engineering, the largest engineering college in the country by far, is about 41% of Georgia Tech. So we are roughly the same size as the College of Engineering. And between the two of us, we cover about 80% of Georgia Tech's undergraduate and graduate population. That represents a massive explosion, a, ra a very rapid growth in an incredibly short period of time. And it comes with both its advantages and, and with its challenges. But one of the nice things that have come along with that growth is that we have not seen our reputation shrink. We have not seen the quality of our education go down. So one of the things that I'm very, very proud of, particularly uh, at the undergraduate level, is this year, this just a couple of weeks ago, for the first time in U.S. News and World Report's history, uh, they decided to uh, rank undergraduate computer science education. So in the first ever rankings, the College of Computing is, was ranked number 10 in theory at the undergraduate level, number nine in artificial intelligence, number eight in data analysis, eight in computer systems, two in software engineering, number one in cybersecurity, and number five overall. The only universities that were ranked higher than us were MIT, Stanford, CMU, and Berkeley. And we found ourselves in the number five spot. This is a thing that we've been trying to do for a long time and to make certain that we're recognized by the rest of uh, the world as being a, a top tier institution. And I think that we can we can say that we've done that. On the heels of being ranked uh, number five overall and number one in cybersecurity, we announced the next day our brand new School of Cybersecurity and Privacy. Uh, it is the first new school in the College of Computing in the College of Computing in well over a decade. And it is the first intercollege school uh, at Georgia Tech, which means that it will be sitting in the College of Computing. It will report to the dean of the College of Computing. But there is a council of deans, which include all of the academic deans, including the dean of professional education and dean of the libraries, who will work with me to make certain that this new school is truly interdisciplinary and crosses all of the colleges. We're expecting faculty and students um, in public policy, international affairs, business, um, engineering, uh, as well as design and, of course, uh, the College of Computing. Uh, we have named our first interim chair. Some of you will recognize him. It's Rich DeMillo, uh, who was uh, the dean um, uh, from 2003, I think officially started in 2003, uh, to about 2008. Uh, he was the second dean in the college, and uh, he has he uh, agreed to help us over the next year as we search for a permanent chair, and we grow the degree programs, and we grow uh, the students in there. Speaking of chairs, I'll, I'll wrap this up by just letting you know that we have finished the search for um, chairs of two other two other schools in the college, the School of Computer Science. Uh, Vivek Sakar uh, is now leading that school, and the School of um, Computational Science and Engineering, where uh, Sun Park uh, is leading that school. In fact, I will point out that if you look at the five schools, including the Division of Computing Instruction, uh, three of the chairs are women, uh, which I think was not something that we tried to do um, particularly, but it is something that naturally happened and something that I'm quite proud of that we're able to show the breadth of computing, both in the people who are a part of it, but also in the sorts of things uh, that we do and the kinds of students that we serve. So, you know, despite everything that's been happening, College of Computing is continuing to do this. Uh, we're growing very quickly and we're responding as quickly as we can to that growth. Perfect. Sorry, I was laughing at one of the, the comments. They said you've been using nitrogen instead of kerosene to fuel us forward. Um, and it made me chuckle. Um, so following up on that, one of the questions that has come in is kind of in regards, so I'm going to bounce back a few points 
um, but about record enrollments and how, how long do you expect this growth to continue? Is there an actual end to how large the college can get? Um, or are we just going to keep kicking butt and taking names and, and growing our student population? Well, so first off, those are mutually exclusive. We will continue to uh, kick butt and take names. Um, uh, but we will eventually run out of students because there's only 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, so we will eventually run out of run out of students and run out of size. Having said that, I actually don't expect us to shrink anytime soon. I don't expect the growth to slow down. Both the first and second derivatives are positive. And I expect that that will continue to be, to be the case for the foreseeable future. And there's a couple of ways in which that is true. So one of the things that's true about the college, and this is true for CS across the country, is that we have been growing and growing and growing at literally an exponential rate. I don't mean exponential the way, you know, civilians mean exponential. I mean literally in the mathematical sense, we have been growing exponentially. But what's been actually just as interesting, perhaps more interesting, is that the number of students outside of our major who want to take our courses and be a part of computing is also growing exponentially. And in fact, the exponent for the non-majors taking our upper division courses is actually higher than the exponent for uh, the majors who are taking those same courses. And you know, an exponent, an exponential divided by an exponential is still an exponential. So we're not just seeing exponential growth, we're seeing exponential growth that is diverging exponentially. And what I expect to see happen over the next several years is that we will see more and more students who are either directly our majors, our minors, or are jointly a part of majors um, uh, in the college as a way of managing this growth. So I'll just give you a quick example. All of you should be familiar with um, computational media. Um, Jen, you are an alum of that program, as a matter of fact. It was the first undergraduate degree at Georgia Tech that was joint across colleges, joint with the School of Literature, Media, and Communications. Last year, we expanded um, DM so that it includes the School of Music. Uh, we are right now wrapping up the last little bits for the new, for the computer engineering degree. You are in the future, we'll be getting a degree, a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering by picking a thread from ECE and a thread from computing. And so that will be a joint degree. And so that's another thousand students who are suddenly a part of the College of, of Computing family. We are in discussions with public policy for joint degrees there. I expect lots of things to come out of the school, cybersecurity and privacy uh, as, a, as a result of that. Uh, we are in discussions with the College of Design about what it would look like to create uh, various degrees there that emphasize capital D design as a part of computing as opposed to computing with a capital C as, a, as first, but, but as equal citizens. And so if we keep going in this direction, you're, we're going to be talking about not 15,000 students, not 20,000 students, but 35,000 students who are all a part of computing. And that's just for the ones who of the set that we currently have. I also expect that we'll continue to grow at the graduate level. Um, we are on track with the OMS to see somewhere between one out of every eight and one out of every six graduate students in the country, people who graduated with master's degrees in the country, being alumni of Georgia Tech. So we are managing it, and we're managing it through partnership. We're managing it through helping people to be able to pursue their interest in computing without having to go all the way down the computer science major, but instead to get the computing and the computational thinking that they need, which is what you want, right? You don't, you, you want people who really want to be computer engineers to be computer engineers, and you want them to understand what it means to think like computationalists, but you don't want them to have to, to have to completely give up on the specific things that they want to do that we don't teach in computing just so that they can take our courses. And you can replace computer engineering with 15 other things. We want to be a part of that larger conversation, and we want people to be able to pursue their dreams. So one last question on kind of these the growth areas. Um, so you mentioned the potential for some new degree programs, partnerships with computer engineering um, around cybersecurity. Um, one of the questions and something that I hear a lot, especially in the recruiting side of things is, you know, will we ever create an undergraduate degree focused on software engineering? We were recently ranked number two for yep. software engineering at, in undergraduate computer science programs. Um, but if you look at our curriculum, we have very few courses that are specific to software engineering. So do you ever see that as an area that the college will pursue? I mean, potentially, I would really argue that um, we do software engineering. Um, and then, in fact, what we do is we we try to build a whole computationalist and software engineering is a part of that. I don't think anyone gets out of this place without understanding some comp some software engineering, um, at least insofar as software engineering is 
the practice of thinking about um, soup to nuts building computing systems. In fact, we're expanding in that space and asking people to think about the consequences of the sorts of systems that they build. So I think one could argue we already do that, even if there are people who feel we don't. Um, on the other hand, I do expect that as time goes on and we find ourselves specializing more and more, we will find ourselves equally pushing on things that look more like what we would traditionally think of as as software engineering. So it's entirely a possibility. Um, I think we'll see more of that at the graduate level as well. Uh, but I'm expecting us to push a lot of these sort of fundamentals of, let's call it whole person computing, uh, all the way down uh, to the, the lower divisions. Great. So I want to keep us moving so we have time. There's a lot of really good questions, some of which we're going to answer. So I want to try and get through these questions so we can move over to those from um, all of the alumni joining us tonight. But responsible computing is one of the strategic priorities of the college. It's something you've been talking about for the last year and some months since you have been um, in your role as dean. So. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the specific initiatives that are currently taking place or that are going to be taking place soon um, around responsible computing and, and maybe define for those joining us tonight what responsible computing means to you? Okay, I mean, I, that's easy. So, I mean, I, I could talk about this for hours. I will try my best to, to keep it short so that we can answer other questions. But it's it's very simple. We Georgia Tech, I mean, those of you who follow um, kind of the news of what's going on out there are well aware of issues uh, that are arising from machine learning and data science, cybersecurity, the surveillance state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people are worried very much about how computing is, computing and the, the systems that come out of computing are kind of infiltrating all of our lives. And people, there's been a lot of uh, concern about thinking more about ethics. And I think that's important. Uh, on the other hand, I think that this goes beyond ethics. Um, as you all are aware, uh, we have had a requirement uh, of what we call the ethics course for at least uh, three decades now. Uh, the very first class I taught uh, when I came back in 2002 was actually what was then 4000 is now 4001, uh, which was what we call the ethics course. The problem with that approach, and the problem is that it, it focuses on an idea of a thing called ethics that you can sort of bolt on at the end of everything that you do. And in fact, that's expressed very much because it's a 4,000 level class. It's the last class most people take. It's not a prerequisite for anything. So it's important, but it's not integrated into the, the curriculum at all. I wanted to move beyond, and I want to move beyond this ethics as a kind of black box. So this notion of fundamental responsibility, where we think about what are the consequences of the systems that we build? And we think about it um, from the beginning to the very end. To me, this is a fundamental question around software engineering, around working with teams, which are about figuring out what the specs are for the problem that you're trying to solve. And in particular, if you really want to understand what that means to me, what it means is at the very first for loop you ever write, I want you to be thinking about what it means to write that for loop and what it is you're building and what the consequences might be. This doesn't mean that you don't do it. It doesn't mean that you're paralyzed by the possibilities, but it does mean that you're thinking about how even the simple thing that you are doing right now can have consequences or be the building block for, for consequences. And so to that end, we're pushing these things down. It'll take time, but we're pushing th these things down through the curriculum. 4001 and its sister courses, which have grown, there's now not just computers in society, there's robots in society, there's data in society, there's law in society with computing. There's all of these different courses that exist. We're taking those courses and we're moving them from 4,000 level courses to 3,000 level courses. They are the, will now be prerequisites for junior design. So that year long design course that we do now, before you can take that course, you will have taken a semester in ethics, responsibility and professionalism, which means that the junior design course and the software engineering courses that go along with it will in fact be able to build on top of that, that the intro to AI course, the machine learning course, the information security courses, all of the, the HCI courses, all of the courses that follow in the junior and senior year will know that you have had a full semester of thinking about these issues and you had a year of thinking about how they work in large projects and you'll be able to do that in the work that they're doing and they can now make that, integrate that into what they're doing and, and put it into context. So we're pushing really hard on that. We've created a new uh, ethics, technology, and human interaction center joint with um, um, with Ivan Allen College. Uh, we have an, a number of efforts uh, across the spectrum, both 
in terms of research, but also in terms of curriculum for, for building this notion of responsibility. We're pushing more on at notions of access and what does it mean to make more and more people available. OMS is a part of this. We're working with high schools, middle schools, elementary schools to bring them on. There's a whole host of things that, that we're doing around responsibility. It's not a thing just that you teach. It's an ideal that you try to live up to. And so we could talk about this forever, but I, I'd rather leave, leave more time for, for questions and any follow-ups on this. But we're pushing very hard on making central and at the very beginning this notion of, of responsibility. There's a lot of questions around ethics and social responsibility and, or, sorry, responsi responsible computing, um, but also around social justice and how we're handling turbulent times and stuff. So. Let's dive into those a little bit deeper, um, sure. a little later in the conversation, because I don't want us to, I know you could talk about this for, like you said, hours upon hours, um, and I don't want to necessarily turn this into a uh, lecture, although based off some of the comments coming through the chat, many of the alum joining us tonight would be 100% okay if this turned into a Charles as the lecture. Um, but I do want to kind of keep us on track with questions and then we'll dive dive into some of the more uh, specific questions around uh, social computing and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things that we're noticing and uh, granted, we're not on campus very often at this point. But when you look out your office window or my office window, um, the skyline is changing outside of the Georgia Tech campus um, and changing very quickly. Um, we are seeing Atlanta becoming a new tech hub in the US. Um, can you talk a little bit about the role that we as a college are playing in this move for a lot of companies um, and things to move into Atlanta um, and how we're actually engaging with all of these industry corporations and, and companies that are moving to Atlanta as well? Okay, I'd love to do that. And in fact, I would tell you that actually ties into this notion of, of responsibility. So just to, to pick up on something you said, so one of the things that's happened since uh, you've all left, uh, God now, is that um, we have completely reorganized the College of Computing building. Uh, so now the Dean's suite and all of the uh, administration is up on the third floor. Cedric's office, OEC, has moved down to the first floor. So we have integrated all of the student activities and such um, with advising, so they're all on the first floor. The second floor is where all of the IT support and where DCI and the lecturers live and where the TAs are so that we can create a space that makes more sense instead of the kind of haphazard way that it's been for the last the last decade or so. So one of the consequences of this is that I now sit on the third floor and when I look out of my window, I can see all of downtown and I can see all of Midtown. And one of the things that I've seen over the last year is I've watched, well, first off, last time I looked, which was Monday, uh, there were eight cranes uh, that I could see directly outside my window, building new buildings, putting up new logos and new signs. Um, Microsoft has announced um, a big push for increasing its presence in Atlanta. Google made a very large announcement um, about a year ago and, in fact, is is actually pushing further and uh, for, for more uh, than they sort of publicly uh, announced at the time. I'm not saying anything that, that isn't, isn't well known, but they're pushing really hard into this. Uh, the same is true for places like BlackRock. Just anyone you can mention, they're trying to come to Atlanta. And the question is why? They're doing it because they want to work with Georgia Tech. They're doing it because they want to be in the Southeast uh, as opposed to all on the, the West Coast. And they're doing it because of our students and because of our faculty. Just that simple. They want to be a part of what they see as a, a, growing, uh, a growing ecosystem around tech. The reason I said this is a part of responsible computing, though, is when I sit down with, with the senior vice president of this or I, I talk to people who are thinking about this, one of the conversations we have is a very blunt one about how we can create the Silicon Valley of the Southeast in Atlanta without becoming Silicon Valley. Um, many of you know that um, I'm from Atlanta. I was actually born in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but my earliest memory is arriving in Atlanta on a moving truck at the age of three. Um, I love the city. I love the metro area. I love the state. Um, I don't want to see it destroyed uh, by a bunch of companies coming in and blowing everything up, and then it's not the place that I grew up in. And I want to see progress, but I don't think progress has to be destructive. It should, it should be creative. And so when we have these conversations, everyone agrees that the goal is to keep Atlanta Atlanta to make it a place that does not turn into San Francisco or does not turn into Boston or does not turn into Pittsburgh, but stays Atlanta and is fundamentally Atlanta. And Georgia Tech is going to be a large part of that. And companies who are coming here want to be a large part of that. 
they work with our faculty now, they work with the administration, uh, they work with the students. We're seeing a huge increase here. Um, some of you know this, but the second largest source of all faculty um, for Microsoft in Seattle is Georgia Tech. Uh, the largest is UW because they're there. But we're the largest um, single source of, of, new, of new talent uh, for a large number of the, uh, of the tech companies, largest single source. And we're seeing that a lot of people who go out there, and some of you may feel this way, you go out there on the West Coast, you want to come back to the Southeast, you just want to live in a different place. Maybe you'd like to have a house that's more than 200 square feet and doesn't cost $7 million to get, and those are the kind of things that you can do here. So people are turning in this way, and they're looking at Georgia Tech to be um, a way of, of, of making that happen. But in the end, it's all partnership. We spend, we spend years talking to people about how they can be a part of our students' lives, how they can be a part of our faculty's lives, and how they can be on the campus and a part of the campus as opposed to surrounding and being separate from the campus. So that's moving along pretty well. I think that, you know, when we have this conversation in a year or two, um, and you can actually see from my window instead of my, my, uh, my office here at home, uh, you will be able to see Google and Facebook and Microsoft, and you'll see all of these companies uh, out, out the window, um, and you will see a growing and ever growing presence of that. Wonderful. Um, so, a lot of the questions coming in are around online computing and, of course, how we have adapted um, to do online and virtual education in this realm of COVID 19. So, how has COVID-19 affected and impacted education at Georgia Tech as a whole, and even more specifically in the college? And do you see long-term impacts or effects on how we do education and research moving forward um, because of the lessons we've learned over the last six to eight months? Well, yeah, so, so <laughs> everything is changing and everything is going to change. So, we should separate out a couple of things in, in, in that question. The, the first is how is it impacting Georgia Tech? The other is how is it impacting the college computer? But there's a whole other axis from which one might think about this, which is, you know, how is it affecting education, qua education? How is it affecting research? Because Georgia Tech is both an education, has an educational mission and has an innovation and research mission. It has actually had a relative, in terms of from computing's point of view, it's actually had a relatively all impact on our ability to do research. Most of what we're doing is increasingly computational. Students, graduate and undergraduate, are, are less likely to come on campus. They're less likely to need to be in front of a machine. Now, if you're doing biology and chemistry, you have a different set of problems. But if you're doing a lot of computing, by the way, even if you're doing biology and chemistry, a lot of that is simulated, uh, increasingly is simulated anyway, you can still get a lot of work done. So the research impact has been less than you might have expected, and people have found ways through blue jeans and Zoom and various other terrible UIs uh, to get us to continue to talk and work with one another and to get our research done. My stu my own students are, are scattered across the world right now and they're still getting as much research done as they have before. It's also forced us to rethink the way we interact with one another. We now have conferences where things were expensive and you couldn't have more than 5,000 and we're seeing 15 and 20,000 and we're finding ways uh, to, to sort of bring people together. So that part has been in some ways positively impacted by our need to think more creatively about how we interact virtually. Education has been a somewhat different story. For the College of Computing, it's been easier because of OMS. Uh, we have been thinking about online education and trying to get it right for the better part of a decade now. Uh, we, two years ago, moved towards uh, undergraduate education that's online, purely voluntary, uh, but we've been able to demonstrate that students going through um, our online 1301 not only do as well as the students on campus, but they actually, um, in some cases, learn more uh, in the same time period if we give them the kind of control and we leverage that. Uh, so we've been doing pretty well. Where the struggle has been, has been in trying to understand how to best take advantage, not of the purely online world or the purely on campus world, but the hybrid world. What do we do if we're going to be moving towards online education and more sort of opportunities for, for students to learn at their own pace, more or less, um, in these online ways, which we know how to do well, how are we going to take advantage of the moments in time, whether they're once a week or they're once a month or whatever, to bring students together to have a better impact without increasing the total amount of work? That has been difficult for us. Um, I think the answer of let's just flip classrooms doesn't quite work the way you want it to, uh, but um, we are seeing some progress in that space. So when you ask me how things are going to change going forward, once this is behind us, because 
this too shall pass. Um, I think we're going to see more and more hybrid education. We're going to see more and more ways of dealing with scale and treating lectures as highly interactive online content, more like books are now. Um, and we're going to have to do, we're going to do smaller, um, more focused in-person interactions. And I think this is unavoidable. I think the, the change that we're seeing now that we've been predicting or people like Udacity, people like edX have been predicting for a better part of a decade, instead of it taking another 20 years, it's going to take another two. We, we simply have, we simply have no choice. And I think that's all to the good. I think that we will see Georgia Tech increasing, Georgia Tech growing in that space, um, and we will see actually better educational outcomes as a consequence, so long as we can keep the students engaged. With online education um, and with the success of OMSCS, do you think there is a potential for additional fully online programs coming out of Georgia Tech? maybe at the PhD level um, or even the undergrad level? Um, and then also, can you talk a little bit about some of the stuff around OMS that's being created to help onboard and better prepare all of these um, individuals who are joining our online degree programs to make career changes? So coming from more of a liberal arts background or a business background and now looking to make that shift into computing. A lot of questions there. I, I, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer and you'll remind me if I missed any of them. I, I, so on the last question first, that has actually been one of the biggest impacts of OMS um, at the graduate level, certainly, is our ability to be able to transition people from non-CS backgrounds into a computer, non-computing backgrounds into, um, into computing. A significant percentage of the people taking OMS CS yes, are, you know, they have English degrees. Right. Um, they have some experience on the job, but they've never taken a real algorithms course. They don't know what um, P is, much less what MP is. Uh, they certainly don't know what the halting problem is. Um, and yet somehow they managed to do well because we have provided a mechanism for it to do it. And also uh, because uh, we have created, we are working with other universities to build bridge courses that allow them to make this transition. And I think that that's where online education has actually proven very powerful. People who are highly motivated, already in their you know, 30s, for example, and want to do a career change. We see a lot of that. And that's why for OMS, yes, we, we not only see 11,000 people, we have an admission rate of something close to 65%. We also know that the vast majority of those taking those courses would not take any other graduate degree if it weren't for this one, not just because it's inexpensive, although it is $7,000 for an entire master's degree at Georgia Tech, but because it is of high quality and it's something that they can do while sitting in California or in Seattle or in New York or in Boston or wherever. And that's been a big deal. And being able to push that down um, at the undergraduate level has been pretty powerful. So does this mean we're going to see more degrees? Absolutely. In addition to OMSCS, we have an OMS in cybersecurity, we have an OMS in data analytics. I expect that we will see an increasing number of those. Most of them will have computing uh, as a partner in some way or another. Will we see an online PhD? Well, the secret is PhDs are already online. There's only a, um, at Georgia Tech, the residency requirement is only a year. And that residency requirement does not have to be contiguous. So we actually have lots of people who have effectively been remote PhD students. You just have to have an environment where you can do interesting research and work wherever it is you happen to be. And that's fundamentally an individual discussion between advisors uh, and students. At the undergraduate level, I do not see us doing an, o, an, o, an OBS um, for an entire degree soon, but I do see us making a lot of the introductory and even introductory upper division uh, courses available, um, for which one can do a significant portion of their bachelor's degree in a particular area uh, online. How much that will work out in the end, I don't know, because we're really talking, I mean, there's no, there's no technical issue. There's no, oh, there's not even a business model question here. It's not, well, how are we going to make this work and still be able to pay everyone? How are we going to, you know, manage our dorms or how are we going to get a good education? Those, those aren't actually problems. The problem is a cultural one. And it is what do the students want? What do the students need? And what does, how does the university differentiate itself and make certain that it maintains a quality experience for everyone? Those are the hard questions and those take time to develop. But I think we already see that we're headed headed in a direction where we're going to be able to provide more and more options for, for students to pursue 
um, even at the uh, undergraduate level. Definitely at the graduate level. Did I answer your 17 questions? I, I lost track. Yes, you did somehow. You can tell we've done these quite a bit at this point. Um, so before I get to my last question that we had pre-planned on, um, I'm going to kind of jump over to the questions coming in from um, the audience. Um, and one of them, and we've actually gotten a couple of questions about just kind of new additions to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and this is going to be two kind of parts that have been called out. Um, but what are we doing around quantum computing in the college? And what are we doing around blockchain as well? <laughs> okay, quantum computing and blockchain. We can say deep learning network. We will like, we will have the, a bingo on all of the. Um... There you go. I'm not saying anything. Anyway, so uh, we are actually pushing on quantum computing. We uh, recently um, brought on um, Moin, who's a professor who was an ECE, who is well known in quantum computing um, and is now moved into the uh, School of Computer Science in the College of Computing. Uh, we are working on ways of increasing the number of faculty we have in that space. It turns out uh, tech actually has quite a bit of has had quite a bit of impact in that world. There's sort of two separate things you have to worry about. One is actually building machines, and the other is building all the kind of the physics behind it. There's the building of it, and then there's the sort of how do you make software work and what's kind of the theoretical view around it. And we have pieces of those, but we don't have all of it. It's actually quite difficult. It's um, quite difficult for for us to to get all of those pieces together. We have to partner with places like IBM. We have to partner with companies that are Google that are actually putting together the machines and the um, and the qubits in order to, to make things work. But we are pushing on that space. How we're gonna turn that into curriculum uh, at the undergraduate level that's more than one or two classes, we're gonna have to increase the number of faculty we have uh, to make that happen. So I'm expecting over the next several years we'll do that. There's some things that are going on right now that involve partnership with various companies and discussions that I'm just not at liberty to say. I'm hoping that we'll be able to announce something over the next year or so, uh, but we have to dot some I's and, and cross some T's. So the answer is yes, we are doing some things in that space, and no, I cannot tell you what they are right now. Fair enough. Um, so a lot of the questions coming in, um, of course, with everything going on right now um, around social justice, um, racial equality, there's a lot of questions coming in around that. So what are we as a college doing to improve diversity and inclusion, um, both at the student level? And if you want to briefly talk about the faculty level as well, um, I know we're also working very hard to have more representation at the faculty level. Um, but what are we what are we doing around diversity, equity and inclusion? Well, so first off, we're focusing on it as a notion of equity. So. Um, anyone who wants to can go to the College of Computing's webpage and you will see our statement on, um, on equity and inclusion. Um, it is something that we believe very strongly in. Um, and when we completely redo the web pages at the end of this year, uh, we will restructure in part uh, some of it around what that exactly means for us. So, you know, keep looking at the web pages and, and you'll, see, you'll see a lot of what we're doing there. We're collecting the things that we're doing. I am the founding executive director of the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing. Um, which has a number of projects associated with it that are around connecting with high schools and increasing access. OMSCS is a part of that actually, not a part of the center, but a part of our, our efforts for access. We've been pushing on um, the gatekeepers, which is to say the faculty, um, increasing a diversity there. I, of course, am personally quite interested in this. Just earlier this week, um, Ayana Howard, who's our chair for the School of Interactive Computing and I, uh, had a column in, in, my, in one of um, MIT Sloan's publication around what does it mean for uh, Silicon Valley and for the tech industry in general to, to deal with issues of, of inequity um, and what the implications are. Um, I was brought in, I became sucked into a, a discussion about this when uh, some of my colleagues at Duke University released, um, some of you will know about this, that released a, a software system that would take uh, pixelated images and, and generate new images from them and had the unfortunate um, side effect of basically turning all black people into white people uh, and a whole bunch of other things. There's a very interesting picture of me um, out there of what I would look like if I, we were in an alternate universe. Um, the worst thing about it actually is that it added about 50 pounds, which I did not like at all. Anyway, so we have these kinds, we have these sorts of things going around. We're pushing, pushing really hard on that. 
when I first came to Georgia Tech as a professor in 2002, I was the first black professor in the College of Computing's history. Um, and uh, still the first black assistant professor. We now have three black faculty. We have two uh, Latino faculty. We include, we intend to increase that as a natural consequence of, of what we do. We have invested quite a bit uh, in something called the Flip Alliance, which um, we don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but it, it pushes on, it's led by Georgia Tech and it pushes on uh, this idea of thinking hard about how we do recruiting at the graduate level and how we do recruiting among faculty in order to make certain that everyone has a, an opportunity to be to be a part of the professoriate or to lead an industry and so on. We, there's just a, a large number of things around that space. I could talk a lot about all the things that we have done and talk a lot about our numbers. We're the largest producer of not just black engineers and Asian engineers and women engineers and engineers and engineers and engineers. We're also um, tied for second as the largest number of, of underrepresented minorities that get PhDs in computer science. We're the largest single um, source of undergraduates who go on to get PhDs in computer science among the whole set of underrepresented groups. Um, we're like the second largest undergraduate program in, in CS in the country, at least we were before last week. I'm not sure where everyone else is right now. There's a lot of things that we have to be proud of, but there's a significant amount of work that still needs to be done and we are working on it. Mainly the way that we, we try to do this is we try to be data driven try to think very hard about what it is we actually see and where we can change the levers in order to, to make a difference in a way that is fair and equitable to all of our community, um, no matter where they come from and no matter what they're interested in. I'll give you a very sort of really quick example. Uh, it turns out that at the faculty level, 50% of all faculty in the top 55 ranked departments earn their PhDs from one of only 10 places. Georgia Tech is one of them. Um, the majority of faculty come from 10 universities across all of the R1s. That's amazing. Um, and by the way, if you look at um, underrepresented faculty, uh, the numbers are significantly higher than that 50%. They're not just 60%. If you look at the top 10, they're up until a couple of years ago, 100%. Which means that you, can, if you bring the right set of people in the room, you can have a huge impact on how you affect the way we grow our graduate programs and the way that we think about faculty and what they do. And so we have built that coalition around other universities. You would recognize all of them. Um, they're all in the top 10 um, to rethink the way that we do admissions and the way that we think through these, the way we think through the way we educate people. And we've, we've already had, I think, a pretty significant impact. Closer to home, uh, we are working with all of our students. We are trying to support community and allowing people, whatever their interests are, whatever their backgrounds are, um, to give them a safe place where that they can explore the things they want to be. When I talk about responsible computing, I'm not just talking about building a piece of software that doesn't destroy the world, although that would be nice and I would recommend it. I'm also talking about building an environment where people can think through what the interesting problems are and have a voice in, in shaping them. We know that um, when we bring diverse groups of, when we bring together a diverse group, we get better outcomes. But we also know that when we bring together a diverse group, people are less happy. They're less happy because there's more disagreement. There's less of people just understanding what other people mean by the words that they say or the experiences that they have. So we get better outcomes, but it comes with friction. It comes with the price. And our goal, I think, as educators and as people who care about this, is that we have to create environments where that friction is lower, not higher, so that we can get all the benefits um, without having to deal with all of the downsides. And that's about culture and that's about creating spaces where people actually feel comfortable doing the things that they're doing and expressing what they're expressing and also feel comfortable being told that what they're doing doesn't make any sense. Um, so going to kind of switch gears because we're nearing the end of our, our evening together. Um, with this new virtual world and everything going on, obviously, Connections are more important than ever. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that you're encouraging and building community within the college itself um, with our students who are on campus and remote right now, as well as with our faculty and staff? Um, and then also share how we can leverage this virtual world to help our alumni become more connected um, to each other and back to the college as well. So to me, community is the whole point of this, right? The reason that we want to have conversations like this um, 
despite the fact that we're all trapped around the world, is because community is just sort of fundamentally what's going on. We talked earlier about enrollment growth and a whole host of other things. The only way that we can manage um, exponential growth, I mean, look, our problems are exponential. Our solutions are linear. And anybody who's taken any computer science knows that that is a recipe for disaster. So the only way that we're going to get around this is if we do uh, highly nonlinear solutions. And to me, the highly nonlinear solution is to leverage the exponential growth. There are an exponentially growing number of you as time goes on, and you, uh, you lag by a couple of years, but only by a couple of years of what's coming in on the inside, which means the way that we're all going to succeed is that we're going to create a larger environment that involves everyone. So inside the college, it's really easy. You know, when I first started this job in 2008 as an associate dean, we had three student organizations. Now we're well into the 30s. Um, we, you know, we had a couple that we had a thousand students. We now have 3,000 students. We had all these degree programs. Now we're working with everyone across campus. We're building these things. The only way that we're going to be able to solve the problems internally, externally, we have to figure out how we can help each other. You look at something like OMSCS. Let me give you a, a real simple example of why, of how I, why I have hope that we're going to be able to deal with all of this and what community actually means. If you look at OMSCS, we grow from zero to 11,000 in five or six years, which is ridiculous and, and sort of insane when you think about it. That's exponential growth, literally exponential growth. How do you make that work? You don't have enough TAs, you don't have enough ways to make it work. Well, the way you make it work is you give something to people so that they want to continue to be a part of it, right? So every semester I have to sign off on uh, what are called instructional associates. These are people who have been in OMSCS, have graduated, but want to continue to TA at ridiculously low prices, by the way, um, effectively minimum wage. And these are people with six-figure jobs going off doing things. And we have almost 100 people who want to be able to teach, they want to be able to TA, they want to be able to support students who are in this program because it mattered to them. It was something that helped them. That is something that has to happen in order for these things to work, but it didn't have to happen. It's happening, I think, because we've created a community or we've created a, a set of incentives, at least, where people believe that they can give back and they can get something out of participating long after they've graduated. And I want to create that environment with the alum. I want to create that environment with our friends. I want it to be the case that those of you who are out there now who are thinking, you know, I really wish I could take these two or three classes. I don't want to get a whole degree. Um, I do the certificate. It's inexpensive, but how am I going to make this work? I want it to be the case that if you say, look, I can give a thousand dollars, then yes, we'll find a way for you to be able to take these courses. But if you don't have a thousand dollars, you don't want to give a thousand dollars, but you do want to give your time. You want to TA or you want to be a mentor. You want to um, help to support a lo the local alumni group, or you want to uh, come back on, on homecoming and talk about your experiences. You want to um, come for one of our, we now have these things called mini-mesters. You want to come for three or four weeks and guest lecture. You want, anything that you want to do that's going to help the current set of students, we're going to be able to, that will provide us enough so that we'll be able to help you and to provide you with further educational opportunities, if that's what you want to have. A way to build a kind of ecosystem such that we aren't talking about 3,300 undergrads. We're not talking about 12,000 graduate students. We're talking about 50,000 computing community friends, some of whom are on campus and some of whom are not. We're working together and are coming and going as it makes sense to them. The metaphor for me, and I've, I've said this before, the metaphor for me is um, the way I think about Atlanta. This is my hometown. I left, I went to Boston for many years. I lived in New Jersey, but I came back and I wanna keep coming back. I want Georgia Tech, I want the College of Computing to be your hometown. I want you to be able to keep coming back. You'll be able to give something, we'll be able to give something to you and you never really leave. So you get out, but you never get away. And I think that that's sort of the right way to make it work. And one of the things that I hope that I hear from you um, today, tomorrow, next week, next year, through Jen, through Brad, through all the various, who said, or whoever it is you want, or directly to me, is ways that we can engage you, ways that we can make you a part of this ever-growing family, even if you don't set foot in Atlanta for another 10 years. You can still uh, be a part of these conversations and help to, to grow Georgia Tech and help to grow the College of Computer Brand. That's what I want to see in the world.
Would you like to talk about any of the things that you see coming up of how we're going to in the near future engage? Well, there's a lot of them. One of, uh, one of uh, Jen's favorites and what I know she's <laughs> talking about is people grow. So there's a new platform. Um, we'll be doing a soft launch next week and a full launch during um, homecoming week. People grow as a platform um, that we have um, invested in in partnership with the Alumni Association to enhance alumni engagement um, around industry research topics, affiliation groups, geographic regions, whatever it is you're interested in. And it's a chance for alumni to interact with one another and interact interact with the college. Um, I asked Jen for a, a way of describing it. We, we just had a nice chat with our um, with our advisory board, and uh, she said, "Well, it's like LinkedIn with Facebook groups." and Slack, which to me sounds like a threat. Uh, I don't actually like that description at all. I don't think that's quite what it is. You should think of it as a platform that is specialized in providing connections for, for alumni um, and allowing you to connect with each other and allowing you to connect with here. I believe that you, you, you should be on the lookout for email from Jen. You'll be sending something else, right, Jen? Uh, you should be looking up for email that talks about um, how you can be a part of it. It's very easy. I think you can just use your LinkedIn account to do it. So you don't have to create yet another password and do all the other things you have to do. And then you can participate as much as you want. And we'll be using that as a, a mechanism to reach out to you um, as we as we try to do more things like this and, and allow you to sort of talk to each other. We want to provide support for you, not just while you're here and not just ask you to provide support for the students who are here now, but we want to provide support for you well after you, you leave, where after you, you go on. So whether you're 22 and a new graduate, or you're 17 and a new incoming student, or you're, um, I don't know, 51 and the, the dean of the, uh, the second college of computing in the country, you have uh, a family with which with whom you can you can interact. And so this is one of the things we're going to do, and we're really hoping to get your feedback so we can figure out uh, the right ways to do these sorts of things. Did, did that answer your, your uh, implicit question, Jen? Yes, um, it did. And you're right. Facebook meets Slack meets LinkedIn is probably a scary uh, way to describe the platform. Yeah, we'll um, on top of it, then, we'll have, then maybe a little bit of uh, deep learning and quantum computing, everything will be great. I'm very good with blockchain. Um, but it really is, you know, it is a very good, good engagement platform. Um, and it does allow mentors or sorry, it does allow alumni to mentor each other and eventually we'll roll it out and expand it to where alumni can do direct mentoring um, of students. So um, like Charles said, be on the lookout for that email. Um, if you are interested in engaging, I know Charles mentioned a lot of opportunities of, you know, our eventual goal is to allow you to EA and be able to take a course for continuing education and things like that. And those are on our radar. Um, they have not been fully developed or thought out yet um, of what that would look like on the back end. So if you're interested in getting plugged in in any way, shape, or form, we have an alumni email that you can send. Uh, any, you know, anything to um, if you want to volunteer or be more involved in various opportunities. So I just put that email address in the chat. Um, and it, we've got like four more minutes. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you two more questions to kind of wrap us up, um, both of which have been uh, submitted via our audience members, but they're just really good wrap ups. Um, so as we move forward, you're in, we'll say, beginning to get into quarter two of year two of your deanship. What challenges do you see over the next two to three years affecting the college or, or impacting the college? Uh, growth. Growth is the big thing um, and being able to manage that growth. Um, and, you know, we're in the middle of a success disaster, right? So we want to avoid the disaster part of it and stick with the success part of it. The other is the pull of our faculty and our students um, to go off in the world right away. Um, sort of short term game or long term game. We have to figure out this is all insider baseball. So I won't I won't bore you with it. But let's just say that a significant chunk of our faculty are on leave at any given time. and We have to figure out ways to partner with Facebook without having Facebook eat Georgia Tech. We have to find ways of doing, giving opportunities to students, building relationships without being, without letting our educational mission and our basic research mission be, be compromised in the process. And I have no doubt that we can do that. I'm not worried about it, but it is a thing that if it is attended to carefully, we will 
uh, find ourselves in a in a difficult position in, in the next decade. And kind of following up on that and closing us out, what are you most excited about over the next two to three years? Growth and the opportunity to do all this. These are not these are not things that I worry about. These are great opportunities that I see. I believe fundamentally, and I have always believed this. Um, and I know, and it's just nice to know that um, the rest of the world is finally catching up on this. Computing is central. We have all latched on to doing something for whatever reason. Some of us because you know it was the early 1980s, and we just decided we we wanted to we we went to Bell Labs and built a computer and just fell in love. And some of us because we thought it was a straight way to a job, and some of us because it. It was just something we discovered later in life. But this thing that we love, this thing that we think is important to us individually, everyone else is finally caught up on. It is central. Centrality does not mean that it's more important. Centrality means that it is a thing that touches everything. And anything that we can do here to make it better will have an impact on everything. Climate change will be dealt with in large part because computationalists will be working with people who understand climate. If cancer is ever cured, it will be because Computing has worked with um, medical professionals to think about it. We are going to be a part of every solution. And so long as we accept that those solutions are double-edged swords and we need to think carefully about them, we will end up in a good place and we should be able to feel proud about it. So my hope is that, and what excites me, is that as we get bigger and bigger and larger and larger and more and more and more central to things, that we will be able to take on that responsibility um, and to do great things. And that it won't just be the people Sitting here, it won't be the people listening. It'll be people yet unborn and people who want to be history majors who will be a part of the, the story, and it's just going to be great. So I'm extremely excited about where the future is and, and the things that we're going to be doing. And I cannot wait until I tell you that um, engineering is 41% of the university and we're 42. You're on mute. That always have to have that competitive edge. With engineering. Don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> well, hopefully everyone enjoyed our conversation tonight. Um, we did our best to get through as many questions as possible and, and try to, if we couldn't answer your specific question, at least answer it in general um, through other questions um, or through bigger picture questions. So thank you so much for joining us all. Um, we hope to do more of these. Um, especially since virtual does make it a little bit easier for us to connect with people across different time zones and in different cities and stuff. Um, so be on the lookout for those events and, of course, the soft launch and full launch of people growth. Um, and with that, Charles, do you have any last parting words to wrap us up for the evening? Thank you so much for joining us and stay safe. We will do more of these again. Let us know what sort of things you'd like to do. Given all the topics you're interested in, we might be able to just focus on a particular topic or something like that. Any ideas you have, send them to Jen's mailbox, and uh, we will figure something out. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Go Jackets.